Hello, my name is Christoph Cox. I'm a philosopher, art theorist, critic, and curator who writes and thinks about both visual and sonic art. My thanks to Fundacion Proa for inviting me to talk in conjunction with the exhibition La Suite, Artists and Works from the Frack Collection. This collection contains several prominent and influential works of sound art, a few of which are on display in the exhibition. I'll return to some of these works at the end of my talk. What I'd like to do first is to provide an overview of sound art, consider some of its historical and contemporary manifestations, and give a sense of how I think about it theoretically. So let me take a moment now to share my screen. Give me just a second. Okay, and I'll make it large. This takes a little bit of time because the, some of the files are big. Okay, there we go. Before I begin, I wanna offer two caveats. First, sound art is a thorny label about which many artists and theorists have misgivings. These reservations were bluntly voiced by sound installation pioneer Max Newhouse in a text written for a major survey of sonic art in the year 2000. After declaring the flurry of sound themes, ex sound themed exhibitions to be an art fad, he dismissed the phrase sound art as a category mistake, the equivalent of lumping everything from steel sculpture to steel guitar music under the title steel art. This brings me to my second caveat that a bewildering variety of artistic and musical work has rightly or wrongly been grouped under the label sound art, everything from electronic and experimental music to installations, sculptures, drawings, poems, and videos. What then constitutes sound art and how does one distinguish it from music and other more established fields in the visual arts? I'll try to respond to some of these worries and questions as I proceed. But let me say initially that while surely there's no hard and fast distinction between sound art and music or other artistic practices, I think that like the term performance vis-a-vis -vis theater, the label helpfully captures a distinct form of sonic art and important developments in 20th century culture. One last caveat is that in order to provide a broad survey, I'll move fairly quickly over a number of artists, projects, and ideas that deserve more sustained attention and will necessarily omit important artists and works as well. A history of sound art should probably begin with the emergence of sound installation in the 1960s in the work of artists such as Max Newhouse and Lamont Young. But I think we need to go back to an earlier moments that were important for its development. The prehistory of sound art begins with Thomas Edison's invention of the phonograph in 1877. Why so? Well, for two reasons. First, sound recording made it possible to install sound, allowing artistic sound to operate in the absence of any live human performer. Second, and profoundly important for the emergence of sound art, sound recording expanded the aesthetic apprehension of sound beyond music. A record or tape registers any and all sound with equal facility, utterly disregarding the distinction between music and noise, and the, distinguish, the distinction between sounds made by human beings and those made by machines, animals, or inanimate nature. The effects of this expansion of the sound world were felt relatively quickly by artists. In 1913, the futurist painter Luigi Russolo wrote a manifesto in which he called on artists to abandon the entire musical tradition in favor of what he called the art of noises. He wrote, Musical sound is too limited in its variety of timbres. We must break free out of this limited circle of sounds and conquer the infinite variety of noise sounds. Let us cross a large modern capital with our ears more sensitive than our eyes. We will delight in distinguishing the eddying of water, of air or gas in metal pipes, the muttering of motors that breathe and, pul breathe and pulse with an indisputable animality the throbbing of valves, the bustle of pistons, the shrieks of mechanical saws, the starting of trams on the tracks, the cracking of whips, the flapping of awnings and flags. We will amuse ourselves by orchestrating together in our imagination, the din of rolling shop shutters, the varied hubbub of train stations, ironworks, thread mills, printing presses, electrical plants, and subways. In the absence of portable technology to record these sounds, Ruslow settled for the construction of what he called intona rumori, or noise intoners. And I'll play a short piece here um, that's composed for these noise intoners, which are these kind of hand-cranked instruments.
Shortly after Rousselot's manifesto, the cultural fascination with noise was extended to poetry by futurist and Dada artists who sought to eliminate meaning in favor of purely sonic values. And I'll play here uh, um, a, a famous uh, sort of noise poem or, 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 or sound poem by Kurt Schwitter is a piece called Orsonata. I'll play just a bit here and you'll see the score off to the left. You can follow along. Fums, pava, tetsu, u, pagif, kvi. Dil ribi ba, dil ribi ba, fums ba, ribi ba, fums ba, ba, bi ba, fums ba, ba, te, ba, fums ba, ba, tetsu, fums ba, ba, tetsu, u. Fums ba, ba, tetsu, u, pagif, kvi. This reduction of language and voice to sound is constant throughout the history of sound poetry, which extends from futurism and Dada in the teens and 20s through lettrism in the 40s and 50s, the work of Henri Chopin and Bob Cobbing in the 60s and 70s, and the work of poets such as Tracy Morris and Christian Bach today. When tape recorders became commercially available in the mid 1940s, sonic artists finally began to realize Rousselot's vision. A key figure here was French radio engineer turned composer Pierre Schaeffer, who in 1948 broadcast over French radio what he called a concert of noises, consisting of pieces he had composed entirely by editing recorded sounds. The most famous of these was a collage of train sounds he had recorded at the Gare de Batignol in Paris. And I'll play you a short bit of that piece, um, Etude de, uh, de Chemin de Fer. Schaefer called his compositions musique concrète, or concrete music, to distinguish it from instrumental music, which he called abstract music. He called it this because it originated in the composer's head and had to pass through the detour of musical notation before it could be finally realized by a performer, that is, conventional music does that. By contrast, musique concrète abandoned notation and performance, working directly and empirically with recorded sound. And I'll note that even earlier than Schaefer, the Egyptian composer Halim el Dab used a wire recorder borrowed from the offices of Middle East Radio to create a tape piece made from recordings of a ritual exorcism. The 25 minute piece was presented in the Cairo gallery in 1944, four years before Schaefer's experiment. And I'll play you a short bit of that piece. I'll foreground, I'll foreground one more key moment in the prehistory of sound art. In 1948, John Cage conceived a plan to compose a four minute piece of uninterrupted silence and to sell it to the Muzak Corporation. This piece, which Cage titled Silent Prayer, was never realized, but in 1952, he encountered his friend Robert Rauschenberg's white paintings, a series of canvases consisting of nothing but an even coat of white latex paint. Instead of seeing these canvases as blank or empty, Cage saw them as airports and shadows for dust, mirrors for the air, as he put it. In other words, he thought of them as staging grounds for materials and events that surround us all the time, but of which we rarely take notice. This experience prompted Cage to revive his earlier idea and to compose, uh, to compose the infamous four minutes and 33 seconds, a piece divided into three movements, but calling on its performer to make no intentional sounds. 
Cage's piece is often thought of as a purely conceptual provocation, a mere idea, the reduction of all music to silence. But Cage thought about it very differently. For Cage, the piece shifted attention from the foreground to the background, from the performer on stage to all the myriad noises that surround us at every moment, the sounds of wind, traffic, and rain, the shuffling of feet, the coughing and muttering of audience members. Though the piece is said to be silent, Cage remarked uh, often that there's no such thing as silence. Until I die, he said, there will be sounds, and they will continue following my death. Indeed, like Russolo before him, Cage came to think of sound as a perennial flow or flux that precedes and exceeds human beings, to which human sounds, such as music and speech, contribute, but that outstrips them. This idea we'll see is manifest throughout the history of sound art, and I think accounts for the prevalence of the drone in, in sonic art practices and, and sound art installation. 433 confirmed, conformed to many of the established conventions of music. Even as it challenges the nature of music, the piece is composed in the form of a score for performance by an instrumentalist in a concert situation. In 1966, the celebrated avant-garde percussionist Max Newhaus brought Cage's concept outside the concert hall and made the first steps toward what we know as sound art. In a project he called Listen, Newhouse invited audiences to a concert venue, stamped the word listen on their hands, and then without saying a word, led them outside the hall through various urban sound environments, power plants, highway underpasses, subway stations, city street life, et cetera. Two years later, Newhouse abandoned musical performance for what he was the first to call sound installation, works in which sound was used to mark out a particular place. In music, the sound is the work, he noted. While in what I do, the sound is the means of making the work, the means of transforming space into place. Newhouse began installing unmarked sound pieces in stairwells, subway stations, swimming pools, and elevators, filling them with lush drones, phased clicks, or other sounds that were unobtrusive, but subtly transformative. In 1973, he happened on a subway vent on a pedestrian island in Times Square in New York City, and was struck by a desire to use the cavernous space as the resonant chamber for a sound work. Four years of arduous negotiation with the Metropolitan Transit Authority and Con Edison ensued until Newhouse finally received permission to climb down into the vent shaft and install a loudspeaker and some homemade electronic sound generators that he jerry-rigged to the city's lighting grid. Newhouse built the sound by ear, listening carefully to the sonic environment, layering frequencies and timbres the way a painter layers color and shaping mass like a sculptor working with invisible material. As in all of Newhouse's installations, the sound was to be, he liked to say, almost implausible in the context and yet also a bit out of place, a slight dislocation of the oral topography. The result was a dense drone that as Newhouse described it resembled the after ring of large bells a sound that summoned the restless clamor of its environs and bathed it in a consistent oral hue. Launched in September of 1977, the piece defined a sonic field that remained in place 24 hours a day for 15 years before Newhouse dismantled it. In 2002, the Dia Art Foundation relaunched Times Square as a permanent install installation that's now one of New York City's great works of public art. And I will play you here just a quick, um, short video uh, taken by some passerby of Times Square to give you a sense of it. Newhouse coined the phrase sound installation, but he wasn't alone in developing ongoing site-specific sound environments during the 1960s and 70s. As early as 1962, the minimalist composer Lamont Young began to envision what he called a dream house, a space that, as he put it, will allow music, 
which after a year, 10 years, 100 years or more of constant sound would not only be a real living organism with a life and tradition all its own, but one with a capacity to propel itself by its own momentum. The project was first presented in public for two weeks in July 1969 at a gallery in Munich, where Young's oscillators generated a field of sine tones fluctuating around 50 hertz, which is the utility frequency in Europe, and what Young called the basic drone of the city. Zazila, his partner, projected pure light frequencies at metal mobiles, which she described as self-luminous colored bodies freely suspended in an atmosphere of continuously moving calligra calligraphic slokes, strokes. Excuse me. A decade later, the Dia Foundation funded a permanent dream house in the former, uh, in the former New York Mercantile Exchange Building in Lower Manhattan. The installation ran for six years before disputes within the foundation led to its dismantling and reinstallation elsewhere, finally in a space on Church Street where it remains today. While Newhouse's installations unobtrusively mark and color public space, Young and Cecilia's dream houses are overpowering presentations of sound in interior spaces that allow the artists precise control over frequencies and their psychoacoustic effects. Both Newhouse and Young worked with drones, but whereas Newhouse built his sounds intuitively, Young's were elaborately constructed through a curious combination of mathematical precision and ancient Vedic philosophy with its principle that the world is sound or not a Brahma. And I'll show you a brief video excerpt of a quick tour through, uh, through the dream house. <laughs> At the same time in France, composer Eliane Radig in 1969 and 1970 began producing a series of open duration gallery installations she called Proposi Proposition Sonore, Sonic Propositions, considering them to be something other than music. Radig had studied with Pierre Schaeffer and served as an assistant to Schaeffer's collaborator, Pierre Henri. After briefly experimenting with concrete sounds, Radig became fascinated with feedback effects generated between two tape recorders and between a microphone and a loudspeaker, effects produced by the machines themselves and modulated by the slightest gesture or barest touch of a knob or dial. Radig recorded and layered these feedback flows onto tape loops of different lengths, playing several loops simultaneously in her gallery installations. One of these pieces accompanied a nearly empty, starkly white exhibition by Tanya Moreau. Through speakers hidden in the walls, three asynchronous tape loops generated tense and undulating currents of seismic bass crossed by unstable squeals and prickly pulses that emerged and receded back into the flow. Like Young, Radig conceived these installations as eternal or endless, continuous and immersive fields of electrical and sonic vibration. Yet like Cage, she preferred noise to pure tones, relishing the threshold at which a feedback circuit abruptly shifts from equilibrium to non-equilibrium, exploring not the harmony of the spheres, but the singular points beyond which order cascades into chaos. These installations certainly reveal the influence of post cagean experimental music, yet they also owe much to developments in the visual arts during the late 1960s. It's not coincidental that sound installation emerged during precisely the years that the art world witnessed what Lucy Lepard called the dematerialization of the art object. For artists such as Joseph Kosuth and Lawrence Wiener, this meant to turn away from the production of objects and toward the production of ideas and words to express them, that is, toward conceptual art. Yet other artists such as Robert Berry and Hans Hacke took a different path away from the art object 
toward an exploration of material processes. This latter group followed the lead of Cage, who in a 1959 lecture objected to conventional musical composition on the grounds that it produced fixed and bounded time objects. Instead, he advocated that artists take inspiration from nature and affirm purposeless processes. One artist at the crux of all these developments was Robert Morris, whose 1961 piece, Box with the Sound of Its Own Making, stands as a landmark work of sound art. As the title suggests, the piece consists solely of a banal wooden box accompanied by a tape recording of its construction. The story goes that when Morris invited Cage to his studio to see the piece, Cage insisted on listening to the full three hours of the tape. Morris was not alone in his interest in sound. Indeed, many conceptual artists produced important sound works, among them Robert Berry, Michael Asher, Bruce Nauman, Art and Language, and Christine Kozlov. It's in this context that we need to consider Alvin Lussier's classic piece, I'm Sitting in a Room. A wonderfully self-reflexive variant on the text scores that through Fluxus and conceptual art became prominent in the 1960s, the piece consists simply of a four sentence description of its process read into a tape recorder and played back into the room repeatedly until the resonant frequencies characteristic of the space amplify one another and overwhelm the sounds of speech. In the 1980 recording of the piece, Lucier's characteristic voice and evident stutter becomes more distant and indistinct with each iteration of the text, eventually dissolving into a wavering metallic drone. And here, here's the text, um, and I'm going to play you just a, some short excerpts along the way. This recording is about 45 minutes, and I'll just take you to various clips along the way. I am sitting in a room different from the one you are in now. I am recording the sound of my speaking voice and I am going to play it back into the room again and again until the resonant frequencies of the room reinforce themselves so that any semblance of my speech with perhaps the exception of rhythm is destroyed. What you will hear then are the natural resonant frequencies of the room articulated by speech. I regard this activity not so much as a demonstration of a physical fact, but more as a way to smooth out any irregularities my speech might have. Okay, so then um, here's a little later in the piece. I'm sitting in a room different from the one you are in now. And finally, toward the very end of the piece. The relationship between sound and space was investigated in several other pieces by Lussier as well, notably Chambers, which places recorded sounds in various volumes from seashells and bottles to cisterns and canyons. And this piece Vespers, which paid homage to bats, equipping blindfolded performers with handheld echolocation devices that they use to navigate through a darkened space. As Lussier put it, I began to think of sounds in terms of short and long wavelengths, not as high and low pitches or notes written in time from left to right on a page. Thinking of sound as measurable wavelengths has changed my whole idea of music from a metaphor to a fact, and in a real way has connected me with architecture. The same could be said about the work of Marianne Amache, 
whose work was less concerned with architectural volumes when with, than with the very infrastructure of buildings and spaces. In 1980, she launched the project Music for Sound Join Rooms, which called for the installation of loudspeakers and transducers throughout a building to generate what she called structure-borne sound, designed to travel not so much through the air, but through the wood, metal, stone, and plaster surfaces of an entire house, gallery, or museum. After receiving a commission, Amache would spend weeks at the site investigating its material features and acoustic potentials. Likening the process to choreography, theater, and cinema, she aimed to create spaces of oral and tactile intrigue, carefully placing and sequencing vibrations to suggest distance or to produce sonic close-ups, generate sonic illusions, entice visitors into neighboring rooms, lead them through pockets of intense pressure, or deposit them into spaces of, of ethereal calm. Um, None of these pioneers described their work as sound art, a term that only came into widespread use in the mid 1990s in the US, the UK and Germany, where it was called Klangkunst and developed strong institutional support. Yet all these artists looked for new terms to describe forms of sonic art that stretched the limits of music and connected with the plastic arts and architecture. The term sound art emerged as part of a broad cultural shift in the late 1990s that I call the sonic turn, a turn that occurred not only in the art world, but also in the academy. Around the turn of the millennium, historians, anthropologists, and cultural theorists began to turn sound and listening, to turn to sound and listening as a marker of cultural and temporal difference. At the same time, the art world saw a spate of survey exhibitions dedicated to sound art. In the decade and a half since, or two decades since, the pace of these publications and exhibitions has only increased. What accounts for this sonic turn? It seems to coincide with the rise of the internet, which connected experimental communities all over the globe and fostered a new awareness of the history I've been laying out. The widespread availability of digital tools enabled translations across media and allowed ordinary people to experiment with sound and image in ways that previously required access to institutional mainframes. The sonic turn also coincided with the demise of the recording industry, which forced artists to look for alternative venues in which to present their work. But I also think that this sonic turn was fostered by the waning of a longstanding paradigm in cultural theory centered on text, image, and representation in general. Sound and music challenge the notions of representation and offer alternative experiences of immersion, immersion and physicality. Having discussed some of the key founders of sound art, I want now to abandon my strict chronology in order to survey some of the myriad modes and formats in which sound art operates today. Paradoxical as it may seem, not all sound art makes sound. Indeed, a number of important sound arts, art artists explore sound through silent images and objects. Fascinated by the culture of recording, both photographic and phonographic, Christian Markley offer, often examines connections and, and, and the conditions and disjunctions between sound and image. This piece, for example, Chorus, presents found photographs of mouths open in song the gap at the center of each image drawing attention to a fundamental lack, the incapacity of the image to supply its sonic content. Another project from the same year, The Sound of Silence, is simply a photo of Simon and Garfunkel's 1964 single, The Sounds of Silence. Markley exploits the, exploits the record's paradoxical title to offer a reflection on the differences between photography and phonography and the disjunctions between image, text, object, and sound. As visual phenomenon, as a visual phenomena, the photograph, the record object, and its text all refer to a sound that they capture in various ways but cannot themselves deliver. Yet by the same token, these mute media adequately capture the silence that the song itself uh, precludes. Later projects by Markley investigated the indeterminacy of translation between sound and image, and in particular, the generative capacities of the musical score, which even in its most conventional form requires the performer to render a set of, philosoph a, a set of visual symbols as sounds. For gra graffiti composition from 1996, Markley posted blank sheets of music staff paper on kiosks and walls throughout Berlin, inviting passersby to mark on them. Markley then photographed the results 
and printed them on cards to be interpreted by musicians as prompts for improvisation. The more recent work of Jenny C. Jones engages silent sound and image in a different way. Since 2011, Jones has employed sound absorbing panels to create what she called acoustic painting. These paintings gesture toward the history of minimalist painting, the work of Barnett Newman, Ad Reinhardt, Ellsworth Kelly, and Agnes Martin, for example. Yet their materials and titles infuse this work with other references, particularly to the jazz composers and improvisers that in the 1950s and 60s formed a parallel avant-garde that informed abstract expressionist and minimalist painters, but is treated very differently in, in the history of both music and sound, and music and, and visual art. Jones often accompanies her exhibitions with sound pieces, pieces featuring layered and distended samples from classic jazz and experimental works. The work of deaf artist Christine Sun Kim is centrally concerned with sound in its many forms and formats. At times, this takes the form of drawings that utilize various forms of notation, among them standard musical notation, graphic notation, and American Sign Language. For example, in the drawing All Day, which you see on the screen, the artist traced the path her hand would take to communicate the phrase all day in American Sign Language. In the middle of this arc is a rest bar indicating silence and the inscription 126 million, 144,000, uh, 144, her calculation of how many rest bars it would take to approximate her then 32 years of silence. In a more recent piece, she constructed a dance party with sounds below 20 hertz, the lower threshold of human hearing. The piece thus foregrounds sound as it's often registered by deaf people as a tactile experience, a profoundly bodily experience. At the other end of the spectrum, a thriving modality of sound art involves the practice of field recording. That is the composition of audio pieces from recordings of natural and human environments. This practice comes from two different genealogical strands. The delight in sounds and noises for their own sake derives from Pierre Schaeffer's Musique Concrète and beyond Schaeffer from Luigi Ruzlo's, Ruzlo's Art of Noises, as we've seen. But there's an environmentalist motivation in this work that derives from a different Schaeffer, Canadian composer R. Murray Schaeffer, who in the late 1960s launched the project of acoustic ecology and coined the term soundscape. Given these two genealogical strands, the work often manifests a productive tension be between artistic and documentary concerns. Field recording is generally presented on CD or tape, but it also finds its way into museum and gallery installations. Two contemporary exemplars of this sort of work are Norwegian artist Jana Vinderen and the Nigerian artist Emeka Ogbo. Trained as a fish ecologist and as a fine artist, Vindran's work often focuses on aquatic environments. She constructs compositions that are affectively intense, but also subtle and crisply tactile. And I'll play you a short bit from a composition of hers called Energy Field. By contrast, Ogbo's compositions focus on urban Lagos, revealing the importance of sound to the experience of the city and mapping changes to the city's soundscape over time. I'll play you a short bit of a piece um, by Ogbo called um, Balogun Market.
Field recording is related to another mode of sound art, the practice of sound walking. Newhouse's Listen is an early example of this sort of practice, which acoustic ecologists such as Hildegard Westerkamp developed further in the 1970s. Contemporary practitioners include Akio Suzuki and Christina Kubisch. Since the mid-1990s, Suzuki has developed a practice he calls auto date, or listen point. He tours a city in search of locations he finds sonically interesting, and then marks the spot by spray painting the auto date logo, which looks like a combination of ears and footprints. German artist, so here, here's another image of that and, and uh, Suzuki himself in, in, in situ. German sound artist Christina Kubisch designed sound walks in a very different way. In the 1990s, she commissioned an audio technician to build her a pair of headphones that transduce electromagnetic signals into sounds. All sorts of objects generate electromagnetic fields, power lines, ATM machines, security systems, fluorescent lights, and so on. And each of these has a distinctive sound. In 2003, she began a project called Electrical Walks in which she loans her headphones to gallery and museum visitors and sends them out into the city. She'll often draw a map of locations she finds particularly interesting, but also encourages people to make their own discoveries. And here I'm just gonna play you a, a short set of excerpts from, from these recordings, which she's put together um, as uh, sound files and uses to compose with as well. Just play you bits of these. Other sound art projects investigate the politics of sound. The most sustained investigation of audio politics has been undertaken by the collective Ultra Red. Formed in Los Angeles in 1994, the group initially dedicated itself to AIDS activism before turning to broader questions of housing and immigration. The group made some early recordings that mixed samples of political speech with experimental dance music, which gave its members entry into music festivals that became platforms for their political interventions. Since 2006, however, the collective has primarily dedicated itself to the politics of silence and listening in public space. Inspired by John Cage and, and, developed, uh, and developing the political potential of four minutes and 33 seconds for what the group calls militant sound investigations, Ultra Red has laid out a set of protocols for organized listening aimed at exploring acoustic space as the enunciate, as enunciative of social relations. That's a phrase they often use, exploring acoustic space as enunciative of social relations. Via site and community specific discussions, the group facilitates inquiries around broad questions of sonic politics, such as what is the sound of anti-racism? What is the sound of the war on the poor? What is the sound of freedom? Participants are invited to undertake sound walks or to produce recordings that they then subject to analysis guided by the deliberately open question, what did you hear? Ultra Red's aim is to attune communities to the affective and social forces of the soundscape, empowering them to compose it differently. As Ultra Red's found, founder, Don Ryan, puts it, with Cage, the idea was that the composer is not composing sounds, but is composing new ways of listening. You are organizing listening. So the sound artist organizes sound as a political strategy. If we're going to take that seriously, then organizers are, are already involved in aesthetic operations. Another form of sonic politics is evident in the work of Jordanian artist Lawrence Abu Hamdan, who describes his practice as forensic listening. That is, he pays close attention to the way that sound is employed in legal contexts, particularly those involving human rights. So, for example, his recent installation Earshot 
in 2016, used audio ballistic analysis to investigate whether Israeli soldiers had used rubber bullets, as they claimed, or had broken the law by using live ammunition in the deaths of two unarmed Palestinian teenagers. The installation consists of sound, photographs, and video that reveal the importance of aesthetics and interpretation in forensic contexts. An earlier project, one from which Abu Hamdan is probably best known, is a piece called Conflicted Phonemes, which mapped the use of language and dialect analysis by Dutch officials to accept or deny the requests of Somali asylum seekers. The installation consists of a series of maps revealing the multiple determinations of accent and the injustice of treating the voice as a passport. A related project, this is one of those maps you, hear, you see here, a related project presents three-dimensional voice prints illustrating the frequency and amplitude of two different voices uttering the word you. Film and video have also been key media for the artistic exploration of sound. Since the, since the late 1920s, film has been an audiovisual medium, of course, yet throughout most of its history, sound has been primarily a supplement to the image, a way of naturalizing the action on screen and suturing cuts between images. This problem was noted at the outset when in 1928, the Russian directors Sergei Eisenstein, Sevalod Pudovkin, and Grigory Alexandrov greeted the advent of sync sound with a statement warning that it would only bolster cinematic illusion and favor the visual. However, a number of contemporary artists have worked to challenge this tendency. I'm thinking of filmmakers such as Matthias Paledna, Julian Rosenfeld, Manon de Boer, and Tony Cox. A particularly powerful advocate for film as a sonic art is Scottish filmmaker Luke Fowler. Music and sound are a central concern throughout Fowler's work, which has featured collaborations with sonic artists such as Richard Youngs, Charles Curtis, Taku Unami, and Mark Fell. But his most ex explicit and sustained engagement with sound came in A Grammar for Listening, a trilogy of films he made in collaboration with a different sound artist, each of them a different sound artist, the first with Lee Patterson, the second with Eric Lacasa, and the third with Toshia Sunoda. All three of these sounders are prominent practitioners of field recording, which like Fowler's visual practice, combines a documentary impulse with an impulse to employ found material toward more aesthetic and compositional ends. In A Grammar for Listening, Fowler worked to foster a genuinely equal collaboration, inviting each of the sound artists to sites near Glasgow that he thought would engage their sonic sensibilities, and then following them to locations in their home cities that they believed would excite him. Fowler closely studied the work of these audio artists and observed them in action, seeking to adapt his image production to the technical, compositional, and aesthetic modalities of his collaborators. Each film then is distinct in its style, form, and content, determined not only by the working methods of his collaborator, but also by the visual and acoustic environment in which he works. And I'll show you here a, um, an excerpt from, the, the, from A Grammar for Listening Part Two, which is um, done with, with the French sound artist, Eric Lacasse. Working primarily in video and video installation, Tony Cox too has used the audiovisual medium to interrogate the image and its relationship to sound. Challenging the dominance of the image, Cox has built a visual arts practice that foregrounds sound and text, conceiving the role of the artist on the model of the editor, the critic, the theorist, and the DJ. 
Early works such as Fade to Black focused on representations of African-Americans in Hollywood film and TV journalism. But Cox's work since 2000 registers the limits of documentary evidence and the peculiar combination of hypervisibility and invisibility that marks Black subjectivity. Cox's solution to this scopic dilemma has been to pursue what he calls non-visibility, an effort, as he puts it here, to differ, defer the image, or even refuse the image in order to talk about it in a different manner or context. This strategy was made explicit in, 2000, in the 2011 video, Evil 27, Selma, among Cox's most visually minimal works. Over a solid gray background, animated blocks of white text in a basic Helvetica font deliver the entirety of a short essay by the Alabama-based art theory collective, Our Literal Speed, an essay titled Notes from Selma on Non-Visibility. The text offers a media analysis of political events considered, considering the transition during the American civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s from the culture of sound and imagination fostered by radio to the culture of image and evidence propagated by television. Challenging received wisdom about media effects, the text argues that the dominance of visuality is politically stultifying, while the non-visibility of sound and radio spurs a political imagination that's creative and enduring. Presented over a soundtrack consisting of two songs by the pop singer Morrissey, the text conclu concludes that in our current political context, most likely non-visibility will produce the most revolutionary visibilities of all, and we will never see it coming. I'd like to conclude by highlighting some key works of sound art in the Frac collection, focusing on two prominent artists, Karsten Nikolai and Celeste bouzier mousineau Since the 1990s, Nikolai has pursued a parallel career as a visual installation artist and as, as a musician, recording as Alva Noto for his own record label, Rastra Notone. Nikolai's work often operates at the intersection of art and science, and particularly early in his career, it centered on sound, exploring the synesthetic relationships between sound and image. In doing so, his work harkened back to experiments conducted by the 18th century scientist Ernst Klodny, known today as the father of modern acoustics. In 1787, Klodny drew a violin bow along the edge of a brass plate sprinkled with a thin layer of sound. The vibrating surface bounced the granules into symmetrical forms, stars, waves, grids, and labyrinths that he termed klangfiguren, or sound figures. Kladny's experiments made visible and palpable the hitherto elusive and fleeting materiality of sound, and his lecture performances dazzled crowds throughout Europe. A Latter-day manifestation of Kladny's experiments, Nikolai's photographic series titled Milch, Milk, um, captures the vibrations of, son of various sonic frequencies animating a tray of milk. And here you see a, a, a series of those. His installation, Velenvana, presents the process in action. Trays of water are excited by speaker cones that transmit an array of low frequency sounds. And I'll play you a brief video clip here so you can see how this works. sound frequencies here, frequencies here are quite low and, and, and likely inaudible for this uh, medium. But. Over the course of the piece, the sound frequencies shift from, from um, you know, various frequencies low to high, creating these um, different interference patterns. The work of Celeste bouzier mougineau too, often involves translations across various sensory modalities, media, and forms of data. Like Christian Marclay, bouzier mougineau is interested in the gaps between these modes and media and the surprises generated by the leaps across them. In another body of work, bouzier mougineau creates installations that generate sounds in real time by chance or aleatoric means. These projects harken back to the musical scores of experimental composers, such as Earl Brown, Pauline Olivero, Steve Reich, 
and Alvin Lussier, who set up systems or situations that produce combinations of sounds that could not be determined in advance. Though Bouzier Mougenot, install, his installations are visually simple and composed of only a few elements, the sonic ecosystems they create are quite complex, involving a whole array of variables. For example, in From Here to Ear, the exhibition space is turned into an aviary filled with live finches. Several electric guitars plugged into amplifiers and placed horizontally on chrome stands serve as perches for the birds who excite the guitar strings. As viewers wander through the space, they influence the movements and actions of the birds and thus the soundscape of the piece. I'm gonna play you a brief excerpt here. Um, Bouzia Mugino creates another seemingly simple but physically complex system in his 19, 1997 installation, Untitled. The piece consists of an inflatable pool half filled with water and a variety of bowls, plates, cups, and glasses. The mild current generated by an immersed water pump causes the crockery to gently collide, producing an, an aleatory field of chiming sounds. And here I'll play you an excerpt from an, a version of this installation at MPAC in Troy, New York. These works by Nikolai and Bourzier Mugineau channel the entire history of experimental work with sound, from Claudney's research in the late 18th century and Edison's in the late 19th, through the chance compositions of John Cage and Latter-day Sound Installation. They exemplify sound art as an art form that overlaps with, but extends beyond music, a mode of artistic practice that takes as its material the entire field of silence, sound, and noise. I hope you'll have the opportunity to experience some of these works firsthand in Fundacion Proa's current exhibition, La Suite, which is on view through November 2021. Thank you very much. <laughs>